last week, so if you can try and let them know that there will be no class next, next week, okay? Is that okay? okay. <coughs> I think that's all we need to internet at the moment. Uh, next, uh, next time we meet uh, in a fortnight's time, um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to be out of Genesis, so that that that, that will be me having one a bit with, uh, with <laughs> Andy McGowan. <but>, um, <coughs> so we'll be on to the Exodus. So if if you're able to read up Exodus one to nineteen for that, maybe. In fact. For the following week as well, the second, following week after that, the, the <coughs> second part of uh, Exodus. So, uh, right. <coughs> okay, let's uh, let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you that uh, from the very beginning you have been a God who has been committed and wholly committed to your creation and wholly committed to human beings. Uh, we have seen that in previous weeks in our studies. We see it afresh uh, in our study this week and indeed each week as we go on. We ask Father that uh, that truth, that reality might come home to us, that we may know afresh in our own experience something of the depth and fullness and wholeheartedness of your commitment towards us towards all you have made. And we ask, Father, that we may be able by your grace to respond to that uh, by giving our whole hearts back to you so that we may love you with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Be with us now and grant us your presence, grant us your spirit and his ministry among us, <clears throat> leading us into the truth, opening our hearts, opening our minds, so that we can see what you have revealed to us in the Scriptures. Help us to see the relevance of these things uh, for our own lives also. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we ask these things. Amen. 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 Okay, if you can turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15. <coughs> going to be focusing very much on Genesis 15 and Genesis 17 today. I just want to begin by reading a few verses at the beginning of uh, Genesis chapter 15. <clears throat> so let's hear God's word. <coughs> After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. <clears throat> and that phrase, the word of the Lord came to, is, is a phrase that... Uh, it's familiar particularly from the, the later prophets, uh, and it's one indication of a number that we have that, that Abraham is actually regarded as a prophet uh, in um, Genesis. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, <clears throat> so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited <coughs> it to him as righteousness, and so on. <clears throat> okay, last week we, we began to consider <clears throat> uh, Abraham as uh, one through whom uh, the Lord brought about his new beginning for humanity, that new beginning 
after the various failures, uh, human failures, that are recorded for us in the opening 11 chapters of Genesis. And these failures, as we've seen in previous weeks, these failures were uh, each followed by divine judgments. Uh, we saw how Abraham, having been called by God, the God of glory breaking into his experience and calling him, having been called by God, Abraham set out on a journey that could be described as a journey uh, away from the city of man towards the city of God. And the last thing that we noticed last time uh, was uh, three of the main promises uh, that the Lord gave to Abraham at the time of his call. And we'll pick up again on these promises uh, as we go through today. Uh, because today I want to focus uh, very much on the, the covenant. <clears throat> we'll go a wee bit beyond that as well, I hope. But uh, we're going to look at the covenant uh, that God made with, with Abraham. Now that word covenant is one we've come across already uh, in our studies of Noah uh, on week 3. Uh, we read there of uh, the earlier covenant that God made with Noah uh, and so with the whole of humanity in Noah. <clears throat> But it was a covenant that was also made with the animal kingdom and with the earth itself, um, with the whole of creation. And we read of that in Genesis 6 and Genesis 9. And at the heart of that covenant, um, we had a string of commitments, certain commitments that God made. That God made to humanity, that God made to uh, the animal kingdom, that God made for the earth, for the whole of creation. And these commitments were expressed in terms of promises. And we get a similar kind of commitment expressed in terms of promises in uh, the covenant that we're going to look at today. And the two chapters uh, that uh, focus on the covenant are Genesis 15 and Genesis 17. So we um, have a look first of all at Genesis 15. The covenant in Genesis 15. And again, we start with promises uh, and the promises of um, offspring. Uh, the NIV often translates the Hebrew word uh, as offspring. Literally, it's seed. Uh, seed is a very significant theme, uh, particularly in uh, the book of, of Genesis. And that's picked up, of course, not least by Paul in the New Testament, who sees the fulfillment of that seed in the seed of Abraham, who is Jesus Christ. Uh, the first time the Hebrew word covenant is used in the story of Abraham is actually in this chapter 15 at verse 18, where we read that on that day, the day the events uh, in the surrounding verses are, are spoken of, on that day the Lord made a covenant uh, with Abraham. And at the heart of that covenant, uh, there are uh, two uh, main promises, uh, the promise of a son or of offspring and the promise of land. And of course, this is not the first time that uh, God has made these promises to Abraham. Uh, these are not new promises. We saw uh, last time how they were implied uh, in the opening verses of Genesis chapter 12. Uh, in the promise in verse 2 of that chapter where God said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. And uh, for a nation to be a nation, it needs a good, great population. It needs uh, a significant population, uh, but it also needs its own land in which that population will settle down and take root and, and live. And uh, from chapter 12 and verse 7 onwards, uh, we saw that what was implied in that uh, opening promise in verse 2 of chapter 12 uh, begins to be made explicit. To your offspring, to your seed, Abraham, to your descendants, I will give this land. So the land is a gift from God uh, to Abraham and his descendants. <clears throat> so these promises, the promises of uh, offspring, uh, the promises of land, uh, were given by God to Abraham from the very beginning of uh, uh, Abraham's encounter with God, uh, with the living God. And in the intervening period, in the intervening uh, chapters, uh, 
Uh, these promises have actually been, if you know the story, if you read through it again, and if not, let me encourage you to do that. Uh, these promises are actually repeated and, um, if anything, they're enlarged upon. And I've given you some verses in particular where that's the case in, in chapter 13. For example, verse 16 there, uh, God promises uh, Abraham that his offspring will be like the, the dust of the earth. Uh, just as numerous as a, a dust cloud, um, clouds of uh, dust. Uh, each of, in chapter 15, each of these two promises, the promise of offspring, the promise of land, is the focal point. Each of these promises is the focal point of um, one or other of the two sections into which uh, Genesis 15 is divided. Uh, scripture, I, I hope you will discover, if you haven't already discovered it, Scripture is very, very structured. Uh, and it's helpful for us when we, uh, when we actually see the structure and understand the structure um, that helps uh, to bring out the, the, the particular message. So in the first uh, six verses, the verses that uh, I've read, um, you'll notice that the, the promise of a son or the promise of offspring, of descendants, is highlighted. Verse 4, a son coming from your own body will be your heir. Verse 5, uh, Abraham is given the promise of uh, offspring as numerous, this time as the stars of the night sky. So in the first section of the chapter, uh, the promise that's highlighted is the promise of a, of, um, a seed, of descendants, of uh, offspring. In the second part of the, the chapter from verse 7 onwards, the focus falls very much uh, more so on the, on, the, on the land, the promise of land. So very... Uh, Verse 7 itself, I am the Lord who brought you up out of the, out of the Chaldees to give you this land to take possession of it. Verse 18 again, to your descendants I give this land. So the land is for Abraham and for his descendants a gift from the Lord. And then after verse 18 he goes on to delineate the, uh, the dimensions of the land. Uh, in terms of the tribes whose territory uh, it was going to embrace. So the, the promises of offspring and land are at the very heart of chapter 15, as they have been uh, really at the heart of the message from chapter 12 onwards. And in some sense, uh, to some extent, what you have in that promise of uh, offspring and of land is just a reaffirmation of Genesis 1. Uh, especially the blessing of God there in Genesis 1 verse 28. Be fruitful, multiply. Uh, well, that's, what's the, that's the promise that has been given to Abraham here. He's going to be fruitful. He's going to multiply. He's going to have offspring like the stars of the, the night sky, like the dust of, of the earth. Uh, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The earth, of course, over which uh, human beings were to rule from uh, Genesis, Genesis 1 onwards. So you have these promises, the promise of offspring, the promise of land uh, being reaffirmed here. The problem, of course, is that uh, time has passed since Genesis 12. Uh, some years have passed. Since the promises, these promises were first made, uh, but in many ways nothing else has changed. Uh, the promises are no closer to fulfilment uh, than when God first broke into uh, Abraham's experience. Sarah was still barren at this stage. Uh, Abraham had no children whatsoever, not even one from whom the great nation could come. Uh, to occupy the, the promised land. So the covenant making a ceremony that we read in the second part of this story uh, in, in Genesis chapter 15, it really has that as its context. It grew out of a, 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 a real experience of pain for Abraham, the father of us all, um, an experience of deep inner soul searching and reflection on his part, in which we find him 
wondering, I think we're meant to read this as, as Abraham thinking about the promises, wondering how the promises that God had given him, the promise of offspring and land, wondering how on earth it could ever be fulfilled because he's still childless. And something of the turmoil of his heart, I think, is, is reflected in each of these sections. We see it in uh, verses 2 and 3. For example, he cries out in prayer, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? That's the problem. The promise is for a great nation, but I remain childless. How is it going to happen, Lord? The one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus, uh, who was his chief servant. He goes on, you have given me no children. So where is the fulfillment of the promise, Lord? A servant in my household will be my heir at this particular time. So I think uh, what Abraham is doing here, we're, we're getting a wee bit of an insight into his, his relationship with God. And uh, he's really asking God, as he struggles to come to terms with his own experience in the light of God's promise, is this the way that the, the promise of offspring is going to be fulfilled? Lord, is it going to be fulfilled through Eliezer um, by my adopting him so that he becomes my heir? Or is it still somehow going to happen from my own physical seed, from my own body? And of course, it's in that encounter, um, encounter with God, where he pours out his heart before God, that um, a further word of revelation is given, a prophetic word is, is given in verse 4, which makes the next step clearer for Abraham. This man, Eliezer, will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. So Abraham is one step further on from, from where he was in chapter 12 now through this intense struggle of faith and through this uh, encounter with God. And we have something similar in the second scene from verse 7 onwards with regard to the promise of land. Um, verse 7 we've read uh, already. I am the Lord, says, says God, I am the Lord who brought you up out of, out of the Chaldees to give you this land to take possession of it. And Abram's response, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I can gain possession of it? And that prepares us for the ritual that we look at from, from verse 9 to, to 21. But of course, one of the, we read these things for uh, our own learning. One of the very practical things that I think we're intended to gather from this chapter uh, for our own lives, uh, for our own Christian discipleship and pilgrimage uh, is that our life of faith, our prayer life, our relationship with God, our times with God uh, should at least on occasions reflect this kind of very robust engagement. What are you doing with me, Lord? Um, what's happening in my experience? Just talking these things out, debating these uh, things with, uh, with God as we seek clarity on his leading, his guiding, uh, the next steps that we're to take along uh, the pilgrim way. And if your experience is anything like mine and anything like that of Abraham, who is, of course, the father of us all in terms of the things of the faith, so that's why we look to him as our example to see if we can learn from his experience as well. If your experience is anything like his or mine, you'll find that uh, the Lord only reveals part of his will to you at a, at, at a time. He, re he reveals the next step for you. Uh, uh, very rarely, I think, does he reveal much beyond that, and we just have to take one step at a time. And that's what we see through the Abraham story. He takes one step at a time. Uh, he moves forward one bit at a time. And what God is doing in all of that, of course, is, is what God is about with us throughout the whole of our lives. He's trying to get us to the point where we just trust him. Uh, and we find that so difficult. Um, and so he has to do it again and again and again with us. The Lord uh, wants us to trust him for that step that he's revealed, for that next part of the journey. 
uh, so often we want to know, well, what's beyond that? And can I prepare for what's beyond that, Lord? Um, so that's uh, the first thing then, the co covenant promises of, of seed and land. I don't want to make any comments on, on, on any of that or any questions there. Okay, let's, let's have a, a look then at the um, covenant ceremony from verse 9 onwards. So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Ab Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. They will be enslaved and ill-treated four hundred years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great processions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet been reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking brazier with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant uh, with Abraham and said to your descendants, I give this land and uh, so on. <clears throat> so, so Abraham here in verse 9 he takes uh, various animals and birds, and uh, the animals and birds that he lists for us here are ones that are later on in the Old Testament listed as those that were appropriate for sacrifice. He cuts, in verse 10, we learn that he, he cuts the carcass of the, of the animals uh, in two, and uh, the two parts he sets out in kind of two parallel roads um, on the ground. Many scholars think that uh, the ritual that is uh, described here explains uh, the Hebrew phrase that we actually find here. Um, it doesn't come out in most of our English translations, but uh, we find it at other points in the Old Testament as well. I think I've left uh, some references in there for you, maybe, um, hopefully. Uh, and the phrase is cutting the covenant. Cutting the covenant. NIV here, uh, most English versions give the translation, the Lord made a covenant. It quite literally is, is the Lord cut uh, a covenant. And that cutting of the covenant seems to have to do with the, the cutting of the, of the animals. There's a partial parallel to this in Jeremiah uh, chapter 34 from verse 18. And there we read God speaking to uh, some folks who had entered into a covenant with him, that, that or about them, the men who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walked between its pieces. So in Jeremiah th chapter 34, that cutting of an animal, a sacrificial animal, and the individual entering into a covenant, uh, with God through that experience, uh, through that ritual, uh, he walks between the cut pieces. And it looks as if that act of cutting the animal and walking uh, between the pieces is like an acted curse or an acted implication. So the parties to the covenant, uh, as they walk between the pieces, they're really saying, may this happen to me if I don't keep the covenant. May this uh, death of the animal, may this cutting of the carcass in two happen to me if I fail to keep this, this covenant into which I'm now entering. And it looks as if what we have in Genesis 15 is something like that as well. Only Abraham doesn't walk between the pieces. And what we find going through the pieces in verse 17 is a smoking brazier with a blazing torch. That appeared and passed uh, between the pieces. And that's immediately, in the following verse, it's interpreted as the Lord made a covenant. 
the Lord cut a covenant with Abraham. The smoking brazier with a blazing uh, torch uh, most likely symbolizes the, the presence of God. Uh, smoke and fire, of course, often symbolize the, uh, the, the presence of God uh, throughout the, the Old Testament, as we'll see um, in coming weeks when we come to Mount Sinai. But it's only this uh, smoking brazier then symbolizing the presence of God. It's only God who passes through the cut pieces. Abram doesn't because you remember we see from verse 12 he's asleep. He's completely passive in this whole ritual. Uh, the Lord has put him into a deep sleep. So Abram doesn't pass through um, the pieces. Abraham is not making any commitment here, but the Lord is making a commitment. The Lord is committing himself uh, to, this, to this promise um, and to fulfill this promise. So at every point in Genesis chapter 15, it's God who takes the initiative um, and God alone um, who acts here. And so we're reminded of the fact that uh, the word that scholars use for that is that what we have here is a unilateral <coughs> covenant, a one-sided covenant, uh, and it's from God's side. Uh, various indications of that, it's his covenant and so on. So God takes the initiative, God takes the initiative at every point in the chapter. God alone in particular makes the self-commitment in the elaborate ritual and Abraham is completely passive. And uh, one scholar who commentates on this, uh, Pam Robertson, he says, The Lord assumes to himself the full responsibility for seeing the full responsibility, uh, for seeing that every promise of the covenant will be realized. So in one sense, it has nothing to do with Abraham. Or it's not dependent upon Abraham. It's wholly dependent on God. So that's the, the covenant cutting ceremony. The, the third and final thing, there's lots of, uh, that we could take out of this chapter, but uh, uh, we'd never get out of Genesis if, if I was to do that. Um, the, the third thing I want to, to, to notice from this passage is um, what it has to say about Abraham being justified by faith or uh, declared righteous uh, by faith. So I've mentioned that the, the emphasis in the chapter is very much on the Lord's initiative, the Lord's commitment to Abraham and indeed to the generations coming after him. Um, but the chapter isn't totally devoid of uh, reference to Abraham's response. And we see that response particularly in verse 6, which mentions his faith. Uh, his trust in God, and particularly his trust in the Word of God, his trust in the, in the promise of God. Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord credited it to him as righteousness, or for righteousness. And of course, those of you who know your uh, New Testament well will know that uh, this becomes one of the, uh, the foundational verses from the Old Testament that is picked up in the New Testament and becomes the ground for the teaching of justification by faith, particularly by Paul in Romans and Galatians. Verse 6 is actually quoted in Romans 4, verse 3, and also in Galatians 3 and verse 6. Um, but let me read to you Romans, Romans 4 from verse 18, where Paul really just uh, takes this verse, and he builds his argument on this verse. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. That's verse 5. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. And that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. And that's why it was credited 
to him as righteousness. The words that was credited to him were written, says Paul, not only for him, uh, not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So Paul there in Romans 4, he makes much of the fact that in this passage in Genesis 15, Abraham just took God at his word. He believed the word of God. He believed the promise of God. Despite how impossible it seemed to him, despite how improbable its fulfillment uh, appeared from a natural, physical point of view. And in this regard, it's quite interesting that the only other time in uh, the book of Genesis when uh, the same form of the verb to believe, as is used here, is found elsewhere in Genesis, is uh, chapter 45 and verse 26, a part of the Joseph story. Joseph's brothers, at that point, they've, they've just come home from Egypt where Joseph has revealed himself to them. He's made himself known to them. And the brothers go home to Jacob, their father, with this news. Joseph is still alive. In fact, he's ruler of all Egypt. Well, how was Jacob going to respond to that? How <coughs> did he respond to that? Uh, chapter 45, verse 26, he was stunned. He did not believe them. At least that was his initial response. Why not? Well, it was so utterly impossible, so utterly unbelievable. So he didn't believe. Abraham is so different here. It's quite different. He's only two places where this form of the verb is used in Genesis. God spoke the promise to him, and despite the seeming impossibility of it, he just believed. He took him at his word, he trusted him, and that was credited to him, counted to him for righteousness. So Abraham declared righteous uh, by faith alone, um, regarded as righteous by faith alone in the word and the promise of God. And what Paul is saying in Romans 4, Galatians 3, is it's just the same for you and me. It's just the same for us all. Uh, we show the same kind of faith as Abram did, faith in the God who brings life from death. Life out of death. Abraham believed that uh, God could uh, bring life out of the dead womb of Sarah, and we believe that God has brought his own son, Jesus Christ, um, out of death uh, on the morning of his resurrection. So Abraham is justified by faith in the word of God, in the promise of God. And that's the same with us as well. So that's a covenant, um, or a little of what we have with the covenant in, in Genesis chapter 15. Anybody... Got any thoughts or comments or questions on that before we go on to chapter 17? Nope. <clears throat> We're getting quieter as the week's go on. Okay, um... Chapter 17 then. Let me read just um, the opening verses of the chapter. One of the things uh, I said that scripture is structured and uh, we see another kind of structure here. Um, uh, we find an alternating pattern uh, right through uh, this, this chapter. Um, uh, one side of the pattern you've got um, a divine revelation or a divine promise 
and uh, on the other side of the pattern uh, you've got the behavior that God expects of Abraham, of the response he requires of Abraham. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. So that's the revelation. And then what he requires of him, walk before me and be blameless. Further revelation. Uh, I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your number. Abraham responds in worship. Abraham fell face down. Um, then further revelation. God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abraham. Uh, your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you. Kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you are now an alien I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you. And I will be their God. And then we get the next um, element of the alternating pattern how Abraham is to respond to that. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, as for me, verse 4, now as for you, verse 9, and so on. We'll leave it there for the moment. So you've got, uh, through the chapter, you've got that um, alternating pattern, uh, the divine uh, self-revelation or a divine promise on the one hand, um, and we see that in verse First part of verse 1, then verse 2, verses 4 to 8, verses 15 to, to 20, 22. And then, on each occasion, you've got Abraham's response. Um, response in the second part of verse 1, response in verse 3, response in uh, verses 9 to 14, and in the final section, 23 uh, to 27. Uh, so, one of the things that, that becomes clear in, in this chapter is that there's a bit more emphasis on what God requires of Abraham than in chapter 15. In chapter 15, God really doesn't require anything of Abraham. Abraham does respond in faith, but um, and God requires little of him. But here, um, certain obligations and responsibilities of uh, Abraham and his descendants uh, are set before us. But it's still abundantly clear uh, that the initiative lies very much with, with God. Um, and uh, one of the ways in which we see that is uh, that again and again he speaks of the covenant as my covenant. It's not Abraham's covenant. It's God's covenant. My covenant, verse 2, verse 7, verse 9, verse 19... Uh, it's the covenant that God initiates, that God gives, that God grants in his grace uh, to Abraham and his descendants. Okay, we'll, we'll uh, uh, look a little at um, the demands made upon Abraham. Uh, but first of all, uh, again, looking at the promises and how the promises that we've already seen uh, are elaborated upon uh, at this point. So we've had the, the, the promises of, of offspring and land before, and they're there again uh, in this passage. Offspring is there, verse 2, verse 6, verse 7 to 10, uh, and numerous times through the chapter, um, the promise of land is there, at least in verse 8. But God adds to it. Uh, and he's got something to say about the nations. So the promise of offspring is elaborated on uh, with a repeated promise in verses 4 to 6 in particular that God will make nations of Abraham. Uh, and the giving of this particular promise is the occasion for uh, Abraham's name to change. Verse 5, no longer will you be called uh, Abraham, uh, or Abram in Hebrew, which means exalted father, 
probably a reference to God. As God. Um, your name instead will be Ab uh, Raham, father of many. The reason for the name change, um, I have made you a father of many nations. <coughs> and similarly, if you keep reading down uh, in the chapter, you'll see something <coughs> similar said about uh, Sarah in verse 16. She will be the mother of nations. So Abraham is going to be the father of many nations. Sarah is going to be the mother uh, of nations. And we might well ask, what are these nations that are spoken of here? And I think um, the reference to the nations probably goes beyond, we need to go well beyond uh, those nations that come literally and physically from Abraham and Sarah. Because that's just the Israelites and the Edomites. Come from, of course, more nations come from Abraham, through Hagar and through Keturah. Uh, but from Abraham and Sarah, there's just the Edomites from Esau, uh, and, as well as the um, the, the Israelites. So the, the promise here probably begins to embrace all the peoples on the earth that were mentioned in the promise way back in chapter 12 and verse 3. All the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you, Abraham. And I think I've given you, I may have given you a list of uh, references where, where that initial promise in chapter 12, verse 3, which mentions peoples on earth, uh, is taken up and actually uses the word nations uh, after this chapter uh, from chapter 18, verse 18 onwards. And if that's the case, uh, as I think it is, uh, this element of the promise is, is ultimately, of course, fulfilled only through uh, the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ, in the New Testament. And that, of course, is the way Paul understands it in Romans chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. Where he reminds us that Abraham is the father of us all. And he's, he's talking there to uh, the church at Rome, which uh, is a mixture of uh, Jewish converts, but also Gentile converts. He says... Abraham is the father of us all. Those of us who are circumcised because we belong to Abraham physically, uh, but also those of us who are not circumcised because we are, belong to the nations, whether we're Jews or Gentiles. Abraham is the father of us all. Gentiles is, is actually um, uh, a translation of the, the Hebrew word here for nations, the goyim. Uh, the Gentiles are the nations, so... You've either got the great nation, Israel, or you've got the nations. That's the only distinction that uh, the, the Jews had and, and still have uh, today. That's, as far as they're concerned, the only division within humanity. Of course, that division is gone in Jesus Christ. Um, and Abraham is the father of us, the father of us all. So the, there's the promise that the offspring is actually going to embrace all the nations. Then you've got the, the promise of kings. Uh, Abraham and Sarah are going to produce kings. You see that in verse 6 and also in verse uh, 16. Who are these kings? Well, certainly uh, the kings, the future kings of Israel. Uh, that reference is made to in Genesis 36. Uh, but this is one of um, a number of links that you have between Abraham and David in the Old Testament uh, and between uh, the covenant that God made with Abraham and the covenant that God made with uh, David and his line that we read of in 2 Samuel 7 and that uh, we'll come on to hopefully in a future week when we're looking at the, the monarchy because that's uh, a very significant chapter uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, and of course, that link between Abraham and David, I think I may have mentioned in a previous week, is, is, is picked up at the very start of the New Testament in Matthew's genealogy. Uh, we're not good at genealogies now, um, nowadays, but uh, genealogies are very significant. And the genealogy in, in, in Matthew um, 
is different from the genealogy in, in Luke chapter 3. In Luke chapter 3, the genealogy goes back to Adam, so that uh, Jesus is the new Adam uh, who comes as the saviour of uh, humanity. But in Matthew, um, Jesus uh, comes at the end of the genealogy that begins with Abraham, that has its centre point in David. Uh, so Jesus, who comes as saviour, is the seed of Abraham, the fulfilment of the Abrahamic covenant, but he's also uh, the, the son of David, uh, the fulfilment of the Davidic covenant. Uh, so we think it's a boring genealogy. It's actually full of rich theology once you understand how genealogies work in the Bible. Uh, there's a story there. It's just a list of names at one level, but it's actually a, a whole theology is embraced within that. Jesus is the fulfilment of the covenant that God made with Abraham is the fulfillment of the covenant that, that God made with David. Um, this promise of kings coming from Abraham and Sarah probably, I think, also points to the fact, uh, something again that we'll look at in, in future weeks, that, that Israel had royal status. Israel is a, a kingdom of priests or royal priesthood. Uh, kings and priests but that's by the by <clears throat> uh, I think the, the reference to kings coming from Abraham may also suggest that we should think of Abraham as having royal status uh, who produces royalty no, it's normally royalty that produces royalty we saw that in Genesis chapter 1 uh, human beings were made to rule the earth um, made in the image of God, so God is the ultimate ruler. He's the great king who makes humanity royal in his, in his image. And I think we have something of that here as well. We're to understand Abraham as having royal status. He's never actually called a king, as far as I'm aware, in, in Scripture. Uh, but there are various pointers uh, to his having that status. Do you know the story of Abraham, Genesis chapter 14? Um, there's a battle between kings there. Four kings uh, are in alliance with one another against five kings. Um, and Abraham enters into that alliance as well. So here's a man, Abraham, and he's entering into alliance with uh, five kings against four kings. Uh, so that suggests that he must be regarded as an equal to these kings. Uh, regarded as having similar st stature. In chapter 23 and verse 6, that seems to be confirmed by the Hittites. Uh, at the time when Abraham, he's just uh, lost his wife Sarah, he's uh, looking for, wants to buy a plot of land um, uh, as a burial plot for Sarah. Again, a, a commitment on his part that is taking seriously the fact that the land is going to belong to his seed sometime down the, uh, in the generations to come. So he doesn't want, he doesn't carry the remains of Sarah with him wherever he goes. Uh, he buries her where she will be there in the promised land. Um, but in, in, in chapter 23, verse 6, um, he goes to, to ask the Hittites for this piece of land to buy it for them. And at that point, the Hittites hail him with the greeting, You are a mighty prince among us. You are a mighty prince among us. Uh, that Hebrew word for prince uh, literally means exalted one. You are an exalted one among us. Uh, but in various points in the Old Testament, for example, quite often in the book of Ezekiel, uh, the word is actually used for, for the kings of Judah. Probably the word, um, oh, something else I had in my mind there. Um, and of course, Sarah. Sarah has a name change in this passage as well. And um, Sarah's name means princess or ruler. So if we're uh, correct in thinking of Abraham as being of royal status, that provides us with a kind of parallel, a close parallel between Abraham and Adam and Abraham and Noah. Adam was king of Eden, of all the earth. 
Um, by implication, I think Noah was also king of the new, new humanity after the flood. And so perhaps we should regard Abraham as a royal figure at the head of um, God's new redeemed humanity. I mention those kinds of things because they're, they're kinds of things that we, we don't tend to, to think of. But uh, um, human beings have been from the very beginning priestly and royal. And we always are. That's why we, we are worshipping people. Wherever you go on earth, you, you have people who worship. And it's because we're, pre, we're, we're priestly. Uh, but we are also got great dignity. We, we are royalty. And of course, when you come to the, the end of the book of uh, Revelation, that's exactly what you see as we, uh, we are priestly serving before the Lord in his temple, worshipping him. And we at the same time sit on his throne, uh, reigning with him. So... Uh, so we should see in, in every generation, or as we go through the scriptures, you would expect to see these truths coming out. So we see Adam in these roles, we see Noah in these roles, we see Abraham in these roles. I've already mentioned him as prophet today. Um, on Genesis chapter 22, we see him on, on Mount Moriah in a priestly role. Um, so it doesn't surprise us that that we see Abraham as, as a prophet, priest, and probably king as well. And all of that is pointing forward to the perfect man, um, who, who is what every human being was supposed to be from the very beginning, prophet, priest, and king, and probably wise man as well. Okay, that's kind of an aside, but uh, there you are. Um, I get kind of excited by these things. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you don't. Um, one further promise uh, that we have here. So the, the promise expanded, of offspring expanded to the nations that are going to come from Abraham, the kings, the royalty that are going to come from Abraham, and then this idea of your God, their God. Verse 7, uh, <clears throat> the promise to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And then verse 8, uh, with respect to Abraham's descendants, I will be their God as well, Abraham. So Abraham is uh, making the commitment and ensuring that Abraham hears, I'm going to be your God, um, but Abraham wants to hear more than that as well, I will be their God. And uh, we have to take the covenant seriously for our own children, for the generations that are coming after us, uh, that we will never see but pray them, Pray the blessings of the covenant into their experience. God commits himself to covenant families. Um, and we need to take these covenant promises seriously. doesn't mean that everybody that's going to descend from us is, is going to be a Christian. But there is a commitment there on God's part that uh, we have to take seriously. And pray, pray that through for the generations uh, to come. So God says here in verse 8, I will be their God as well. So through this covenant, uh, God is committing himself to this particular people forever. It's an everlasting covenant to be their God. And all God's covenants are everlasting covenants, uh, eternal covenants. The implication seems to be uh, that uh, Abraham and the, his descendants are to have no other God. I'm going to be their God. Uh, the implication uh, seems to be um, that they should think of God as their God, as their unique God. That's not actually spelt out in this chapter. It's not spelt out at this stage. It, 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 it is spelt out in the next book uh, of the Bible. It's spelt out in the book of Exodus, in the covenant that God goes on to make with the children of um, Abraham, the children of Israel uh, at Mount Sinai. And here we come to the very essence of the covenant relationship. And it's just that at the heart of the covenant is, is a relationship. It's a relationship between God and human beings. It's a relationship between this God and Abraham and his, his descendants. I will be yours. I will be theirs. <coughs> a couple of weeks' time, a few weeks' time, when we come to the the covenant that God made with Israel at Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus, that gets expanded 
Uh, we still hear, I will be your God, but then it's made very explicit, you will be my people. You will be my people. I will be yours, and you will be mine. Okay. More emphasis on the, the bilateral nature of the covenant, the two-sided nature of the covenant. God makes his commitment, but we have to make our commitment as well to him. We have to respond to him. Uh, the marriage takes place at Mount Sinai, and God says, yes, I'll be yours, I'll be faithful to you, and Israel responds, yes, I'll be yours, God and I'll be faithful to you. Everything we have, uh, you have said, we will do. That's the commitment that Israel made at Mount Sinai. Of course, we know that they broke it at Mount Sinai as well. Um, and nothing has changed, of course, in one sense, over the, the centuries. <coughs> um, so this, uh, this emphasis uh, is still on God's initiative here. Uh, God's role, God's side in this uh, relationship. God commits himself to Abraham and to his seed forever. And this is part of what it meant when God said to Abraham way back in Genesis 12, I bless you. Uh, I'll be your God. I'll be with you. I'm committing myself to you forever, for, for all eternity. And remember that, that God has also promised that, um, that through Abraham all nations will experience that blessing. Or those from every nation will experience that blessing. Uh, so the implication of that is that uh, those from every nation uh, will come to be in that privileged position where the God of Abraham is their God. And they are his people. Okay, uh, uh, conscious of our uh, time flying. So, in terms of the response that's required of, of Abraham here, um, we have it in, in uh, three verses, <clears throat> or three responses. Uh, he's to walk before God, verse 1. Um, so, he's to live a life of faith in the presence of El Shaddai, uh, the Almighty God. Uh, again, in verse 1, he's to be blameless, uh, which doesn't mean um, primarily uh, that he's to be morally perfect. Uh, the basic idea of the Hebrew word there is that it's, it's complete. Um, it's, it's complete. So, there's, so he's looking for, the Lord is looking for a completeness a, a, of commitment, a, a wholeheartedness, not, an undiv not a divided heart. With only part of the heart given to God, uh, it's that idea of wholeness of heart given to the Lord. So wholeheartedness of commitment to the Lord. And then the third requirement is that of uh, male circumcision within the family, uh, verse 10. Um, and that becomes the sign of the covenant. Now at this point, there's no explanation given uh, about circumcision. Uh, that comes later on. Uh, particularly in the book of Deuteronomy. Okay, any, any comments there or any questions on any of that? <coughs> no? We all, we all fallen asleep. You mentioned that the... Um was with the nations um, and other nations surrounding Israel. Um, it would be better for today if we remembered how the nations remembered that covenant that the Lord made so many hundreds of years ago. Uh, well, yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, The Jews regard themselves very much as the covenant people, um, so they don't understand it in the same way as we do, as a covenant that's extended to to all the nations. But yeah, all the, all the nations come under the um, uh, the blessing of God, ultimately. 
through Jesus. Okay. Uh, the final thing I want, uh, I want um, <clears throat> to do is um, just have a look at, uh, uh, maybe encourage you to, to read, uh, um, particularly Genesis 12 onwards, but also uh, the whole of the five books of Moses in the light of the covenant promises. Uh, so that's why I've entitled this Tracking the Fulfillment of the, of the Covenant uh, Promises. Uh, the story that we have from Genesis 12 onwards, right through the rest of Genesis, but through the following books as well, is actually uh, the story of the unfolding of what's given there in Genesis 12. But so Genesis 12 is absolutely key for our understanding of, of the whole of um, history. Uh, and, and the whole of theology. Um, so at one, at one length, uh, in one sense, the, the whole of the rest of Genesis is just an unfolding of the story of the promises. The whole of uh, the books of Moses is about that. Uh, really, the whole of the Old Testament is about God's unfolding the promises. And that's true of the, the New Testament as well. And of course... Uh, ultimately, um, the promises that God makes, makes to Abraham here have their fulfillment in, in Jesus Christ, who is, as I said, already the seed of Abraham. All the promises of God that come in the Old Testament, Paul says, are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. They have their fulfillment uh, in Jesus. The various promises that have been given to Abraham and his descendants uh, I think can be summed up under three main headings, three umbrella headings, if you like. Uh, the promise of descendants, posterity, uh, and you can think of a son, you can think of a nation, you can think of uh, the nations coming from that, but it's all about um, posterity, it's all about the seed, it's all about descendants. Uh, then secondly, um, the second element of the promise is about a relationship with God. And now you can think of uh, that in terms of uh, God's blessing of individuals and families and nations, uh, God's covenant with individuals and nations, God's commitment, uh, God's presence with them or whatever. But that sense of relationship with God, and then there's the land, which we know of still today as the promised land. So three elements of promise, posterity, or descendants, uh, relationship with God, and land. And as you read through the Bible, but start with, with the book of Genesis, as from Genesis chapter 12, as you read through these stories, uh, with each new story you need to ask the question, does this story have anything to do with any of these three main elements of the promise that God gave to Abraham? Or... Uh, Another way of putting it is, does this story teach me anything about the fulfillment of the promise? Or an obstacle put in the way of the fulfillment of the promise? A hurdle uh, in the way of the fulfillment of the promise? Of any one of these three main elements of the promise? Take, for example, the, um, the element of the promise that has to do with posterity, um, because that's that's the one that's to the fore largely in the rest of the book of Genesis. Many other stories in, in, in Genesis are about this. Really from Genesis 12 to uh, Genesis 20, uh, the early chapters of uh, Abraham's story, uh, the question again and again in all of these chapters, or, or most of them at least, is will the promise of a son be fulfilled? Will the promise of a great nation be fulfilled? Will Abraham even have one son? He might become the means for the fulfillment of that promise in the generations to come. So for most of the Abraham story, it's a question about that. And Abraham and Sarah, we see them struggling. And step by step, God takes them through. Abraham's wondering if it's Eliezer who's going to um, 
be the one through whom the promise is fulfilled. In chapter 15, God shows him no. So they know from that point onwards that it's going to come from Abraham's seed. So in chapter 16, then Abraham and Sarah are thinking through, well, how can it happen? And Sarah says, well, maybe I'm the problem with my barrenness. Uh, the promise is definitely now coming through your seed. So why don't you take my servant girl, Hagar, and she can become a surrogate mother through whom the promise might be fulfilled. Taking things into their own hands. Of course, chapter 17, well, we, we recognize in chapter 16, no, that's not the way to be fulfilled. Chapter 17, it becomes absolutely clear that it's not just from Abraham's body that the child is going to come. It's actually going to come from Sarah's body as well. But she couldn't wait for that, of course. Uh, so that's one of the problems. Uh, and eventually, of course, uh, Isaac is born in chapter 21. And the next chapter is about Abraham, go and take your son and sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. What's going to happen to the promise? God, you promised that a great nation would come for me. Uh, I, I, I've waited all this time for the one son through whom that can happen. All of a sudden it's happened, it's miraculously happened, and now you're taking him away? What are you doing, God? How, how does this affect the promise? It's all about the fulfillment of the promise. Uh, so keep asking yourself these questions as you, as you read through Genesis and indeed the, uh, the rest of the, the Old Testament as well. <clears throat> uh, and uh, that's the way we have to understand the significance of uh, quite a number of the other events that, that happen in these chapters. <clears throat> For example, the uh, each of the, the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, they have a wife who's barren. Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, in turn, uh, they're each of them uh, barren. Now you have to ask the question, why is that the case in the light of the promise that God has given at the very beginning that from Abraham and through his whole line, uh, a, a great nation is going to come. What on earth is God doing? Of course, he's showing us in all of these things that it's not up to us. It's not by human strength that any of these things happen. It's by God's, by God's action, by God's grace, by God's promise. If we were in charge of that uh, operation, we'd, we'd have um, ensured that fertile women would be chosen. Or whatever. Then you have three stories uh, where Abraham and Isaac put their wives in danger. Uh, Genesis 12, Genesis 20, Genesis 26. Abraham does it twice. <coughs> you ever sinned the same sin twice? We don't seem to learn. And he was followed in the next generation by his son. Didn't learn anything from his father's generation. From his father's mistakes. You see what each of them is doing? Uh, each of them is actually putting in danger the life of the woman in whose womb the promise is going to be fulfilled. So they're actually threatening the fulfillment of the promise. And all uh, to save their own skin. Then uh, there are the stories of the human initiatives that lead to disaster. Uh, the main one, I suppose, I've just mentioned, Sarah's plan to father a child for, for Abraham through Hagar, chapter 16. And then if you know the, the other stories in Genesis well, you'll, you'll know that it's, it's all about conflict, or a lot of it is about conflict between brothers, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, uh, Joseph and his brothers. Uh, but the significant thing about each of these conflicts is that um, they threaten the fulfillment of the promise to some extent. So how is the story that you're reading, how, how is it, uh, does it either fulfill the promise or put an obstacle in the road of the fulfillment of the promise? And then you've got other things like the famines in the land of Canaan that uh, you read of in, um, at various points. <clears throat>
So with each new story that you come across in Genesis and beyond it as well, we have to ask the question, what if anything has this particular story got to do with the question of uh, the fulfillment of the promise to the patriarchs? And almost every story touches on that question. If we take the, the element of the, the promise that we've been looking at, the, the promise of uh, descendants, of posterity, throughout the Genesis narrative, uh, the fulfillment of that promise is threatened at various points. It's frustrated again and again. Sometimes it's frustrated uh, through difficult providential circumstances. Famine in the land or... Or, or the barrenness of the, the wives of the, of the patriarchs. But more often than not, the problem actually lies with God's own people. Uh, it's the people of God, the covenant people of God, the people whom, to whom God has committed himself totally, wholeheartedly. They're the problem. Nothing has changed in 4,000 years. Um, and sometimes they're the problem because they're afraid Sometimes it's because they don't believe. Uh, sometimes it's because they're impatient and they want to work things out for themselves, like Sarah in chapter 16. <coughs> or sometimes it's just through the fighting and squabbling and uh, hostility within their own ranks. Rather fighting with brother. Um, so that's where the church is to be as well. Nothing new because we're sinners. Um, to whom God has committed himself. And yet, uh, despite all of that, the story of Genesis teaches us that, uh, that nevertheless, bit by bit, the promise is fulfilled towards the end of Genesis, chapter 46 and verse 27. The members of Jacob's family which went to Egypt were 70 in all. Uh, well, it's nowhere near nation size, but actually by the time you come to the end of Exodus <coughs> chapter 1, uh, the population is big enough for a nation. How has that happened? Well, because of the faithfulness of God. Not because of Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or the children of uh, of Israel, it's because of the faithfulness of God. Here's how one uh, a commentator puts it, even if the bearers of the, those promises represent the greatest threat to the promises, the individual lives of the promise bearers cannot abort those promises. It's wonderful if the, if the bearers of those promises, that's Abraham and his family, us today, represent the greatest threat to the promises. The individual lives of the promise bearers cannot abort those promises. Unholy acts do not sidetrack the holy will of God. Whenever they find themselves in a delicate situation, God saves his elected own from destruction. Genesis 12, the whole story of the uh, of the patriarch from Genesis 12 to Genesis 50 is a story about the faithfulness of God to his promise. And that's the whole of the Old Testament is that. Uh, the whole of the New Testament is, is that as well. As the writer to the Hebrews reminds us in chapter 10 verse 23, he who promised is faithful. So well might we sing, great is thy faithfulness. O oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. And in closing, let's just uh, remember that in and through uh, Jesus Christ, who is the seed of Abraham, each and every one of us, each and every Christian, is in a new covenant relationship with God and will be forever. And that's picked up in Revelation 21, verse 3. They will be his people. God himself will be with them. And be their God. We will be his. We will be ours. We will be married forever. To him and he to us. And on that day we will be as faithful to him as he is now. And always will be to us.
and in and through Jesus we inherit uh, not just the promised land, but the whole earth, the whole creation. Um, and really our inheritance, of course, is uh, nothing short of God himself. We are heirs of God. Any questions or comments on any of that? That's us. How do you define a patriarch, and for how long did they continue? Uh, well, the, the, the name patriarch is usually associated with uh, the, um, the generations in, in Genesis. So the, uh, that's usually the patriarchal period is from, from the call of Abraham to, to the time of the Exodus, really. But that's just a, a technical term in testing studies. And the other question, uh, you refer to the books of Moses in Scripture, I think it's five times it says the book of Moses. And if you look at uh, the beginning of Leviticus, it starts with and, and I think Deuteronomy starts with and. I know it could be to do with translation. But was it originally one book and then divided up, or is it five separate books? Um. Uh, well, it's it's certainly it's certainly five five set separate books. Um, uh, almost every sentence in Hebrew narrative begins with an. Um, that's that's just uh, an element of it. But um, um, I, the the books of Moses are what we call the the first five books. They, they've given the title Pentateuch or Torah, the Jews call them the, the Torah and so on. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. It, 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 it seems quite clear uh, that Moses didn't write the last part of Deuteronomy, uh, the last part of the last chapter of Deuteronomy, which talks about his death and so on. Although uh, there have been those who suggest that, that he wrote it prophetically yeah. Do you have any time to talk about Melchizedek? Oh, I was just going to ask about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I don't think so today. There's, <laughs> lot, there's lots of other things. Uh, yeah, I, I, for these talks I have to, to be very, very selective and kind of focus on elements um, that we'll actually see linked through from beginning to end of the Old Testament. So Melchizedek is kind of an uh, unusual character. And, uh, you can speak to one of the men up there at the back, Norman. Anything in particular you had in mind about Melchizedek? No, I'm just wondering if you had um, insight she had. Yeah, because she was the king of Salem, so there's connections there with Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem, the priesthood in Jerusalem, royal priesthood in Jerusalem. All. So it, it comes back to the themes of royalty and priesthood. Was he eternal? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's interpretation for another day, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, close with you. Father, we do bless you for uh, the evidence that we see in the scriptures of uh, the tremendous commitment that you have made and keep making to human beings. And we thank you, Father, uh, afresh today for your faithfulness, your faithfulness to Abraham, your faithfulness to all the generations coming from Abraham, uh, your faithfulness uh, to the line of faith that comes from Abraham that will touch all the nations of the earth. Uh, and we thank you, Father, that um, uh, you bring uh, your covenant people at last to that place um, and to, that you have purposed for them from all eternity, uh, where they will be uh, royalty before you, where they will have priestly service before you. 
I would thank you, Father, that you include us in that. Help us uh, to be more faithful by your grace and uh, through your word and spirit, as long as we are on the face of this earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.